Well, thanks, Leah, and thank you for inviting me. Um, just by a strange coincidence, we're uh, playing cricket here this week, so uh, it's worked out uh, worked out very well. Amazing how these things work out. Um, Okay, what I'm going to do uh, today is, is three things. Uh, it seems to me that we've all got to talk about our own low-carb journey, so I'm not going to be any exception. It won't be quite as interesting as the last two, but uh, anyway. Then I'm going to talk just very briefly about the effects on, on health that have largely uh, covered by the other speakers. And then uh, focus on the effects on sort of athletic performance of, uh, of a low-carb uh, diet. And I use the term LCHF. I mean, it's uh, obviously interchangeable with, uh, with uh, paleo and Atkins and, and various things. Okay, so my low-carb journey, I've always been interested in, uh, in nutrition. Uh, I co-authored the first sports nutrition book in Australia about 30 years ago and uh, with Karen Inge, a dietitian uh, in Melbourne. But to be honest, I sort of lost a bit of interest in sports nutrition. It became pretty boring. It was all carbs, 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 you know, carb loading. We've got to need lots of uh, glycogen uh, supply in our muscle had to be... Uh, they had to be full, and carbs were the answer, and drinks were all Powerade and Gatorade and so on. And that's the way it was for 30 years. Um, so I'd sort of uh, put nutrition on the back burner, to be honest. So uh, three years ago, I was uh, working in, uh, in England, uh, working for a football club called Liverpool, who uh, were once great until I got there, and ever since then they've been terrible. Um, <laughs> But uh, when I got appointed to, uh, to Liverpool, uh, I sort of thought, you know, I'd been in England previously and, and Liverpool was a pretty run-down sort of place. And uh, when I got appointed, I thought, oh, wow, you know, a fantastic club, shit city. And after about six months, I realised it was a shit club and a fantastic city. But uh, um, it's a great place. Um, anyway, I was working there and uh, I just turned 60. I know you find that hard to believe, but yes, that's true. Um, and uh, I was 93 kilograms and I was, uh, I was overweight. Um, and I'd probably put on half a kilogram a year for the previous 30 years, say, and um, that's despite doing all the right things, what I was supposed to do, low fat this, low fat that, uh, lots of pasta, lots of cereal, rice, uh, grains and so on, following the guidelines like a good boy should. And uh, as a result, I was uh, overweight and uh, borderline obese. My BMI was about 30, I think. And, uh, you know, my kids are starting to sort of poke you in the belly and say, you know, Dad, you know, come on, do something. And I said, well, you know, I'm doing all the right things. So that was my situation. And, and that was, I was 60, the same age as that my father had developed type 2 diabetes, which eventually was, uh, was the thing that, uh, that killed him. So uh, I was, uh, you know, a little bit concerned. I didn't want to go down that track. So uh, around that time... Uh, I was an old friend of mine, Tim Noakes, who uh, I'd known for many years and we'd spoken at a lot of conferences together and so on. And uh, Tim was someone who I'd always really admired as being very smart, uh, probably the smartest guy I knew. He'd, uh, he'd challenged a lot of orthodoxies in sports medicine and sports science and often been proven to be correct. Anyway, around that time, three years ago, Tim came out. Now, not in the way people usually come out these days, <laughs> but um, uh, he came out as being uh, anti-carbs. And... Uh, in his book, The Law of Running, which is sort of the Bible of, uh, of running, he had uh, pages and pages on, uh, on the importance of carbohydrates. And uh, he ripped all of them up and said, no, I was wrong, which is pretty, uh, pretty hard to do when you've been a big advocate of something. He said I was wrong, uh, and from his own experience and the experience of others, he believed that reducing carbs and uh, replacing them with healthy fat was, uh, was the way to go. And I remember seeing that and I was thinking, oh, boy, that's interesting. You know, Tim's a smart guy, much smarter than me. You know, uh, maybe there's something in that. So I thought, well, I should, I should look into this. So I decided to go out and, uh, and read. And I, uh, I bought Good Calories, Bad Calories, uh, Gary Taubes' book. Um, and uh, that sort of just blew me away. I just kept reading about reading through it. And there was all the arguments as to why uh, you know, low carb was superior to low fat. But more interestingly than that, I think, was the sort of the story of the politics of how the low fat movement sort of had won out 30 years ago over the low carb movement. And, uh, and the more I read this book, every night I'd go to bed and say, no, this couldn't be right. You know, look, we couldn't have got this wrong for 30 years. Surely not. You know, this is the, the whole uh, medical profession. Um, so uh, by the end of that, I thought, oh, gee, you know, this is pretty convincing. And I thought, well, the best thing to do now is to try it myself. And, uh, you know, we like uh, science in, uh, in medicine. Usually we have a more than an N equals one, but uh, that was the case in, uh, in this time. So I decided I'd go be, uh, do my own experiment. I got my bloods taken or my lipids and, and everything beforehand, and I went on to my uh, low-carb diet. And uh, all the things that we've, uh, we've talked about, I basically stopped eating um, pasta and rice and bread and cereals and grains and fruit juices, 
all the sugars and beer, and replaced them with uh, with good healthy fats. And uh, did that for uh, for three months. Um, pretty sort of hardcore. Um, you know, I did have the odd glass of red wine, as you can see in the uh, in the picture there, and a bit of dark chocolate and things. But uh, there's lots of other good things in red wine, so it's okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I was I had uh, you know pretty low carbs for uh, for three months. So uh, at the end of that three months, um, I was half the man I used to be. I'd lost 13 kilograms. So 13 weeks, 13 kilograms, nice and symmetrical. And uh, I certainly was a different body shape uh, to what I was. And uh, so in that time, as I said, I lost 13 kilograms of weight. I had completely reduced appetite. So instead of having my normal cereal of uh, you know, muesli and so on, and then getting to about 11 o'clock and saying, God, it must be lunchtime soon, I'd be starving. I wouldn't even have lunch. And I don't, don't have lunch these days and haven't had lunch since uh, two meals a day, I'm just not hungry at all. Um, my lipids, I increased my HDL cholesterol and decreased my triglycerides significantly. I'd previously had uh, abnormal uh, improvement ratio. I'd had a uh, fatty liver, uh, same as David mentioned before. My liver function tests were uh, quite abnormal. I'd Like a typical doctor, I totally ignored that and carried on regardless. And uh, that totally resolved in that three months. The tests I did at the end of it, the liver function was was the lower part of normal. It was quite dramatic, um, and uh, I had to have a new wardrobe. But that's you know you can't have costly business that. So that was my three months of uh, of low carb, and uh, so I really you know was convinced after that that uh, this was something pretty uh, pretty special. So let's uh, let's quickly review uh, the, the positive effects of, uh, of low carb, high fat uh, diets. Let's talk about weight, and it's already been mentioned that uh, obesity, you know, started rising in uh, in the late uh, 1970s, early 1980s, and this is the American figures, but the Australians are very similar. And uh, in both of our countries, basically a third of people are obese, another third are overweight. So you've got two thirds, more than two thirds now, are either overweight or obese, and that uh, that's my definition of an ep epidemic. And when did it all start? Well, what Australia coincidence. It started just at the very same time as we brought in the low-fat guidelines. Amazing coincidence. Um, now, pyramids, you know, there are good pyramids and there are bad pyramids and, uh, and good pyramids. So uh, they, that was a disaster, that, uh, that bad pyramid. This one's a much better one. And uh, let's compare diets from, uh, from low carb and low fat. And the low carb is the blue and the low fat is, is the black. And there have been uh, more than 20 different studies comparing the two diets. And every single one of them shows more effect from a weight loss of a low carb to a low fat. And only yesterday in The Lancet uh, came out the latest one that showed that low fat diets don't work. Now we're right up to date in the low carb down under, don't complain about that, you know, hot off the press. It only came out yesterday. So, uh, and again, you know, these things have created a big, uh, a big story. This is the, you know, the front pages of two of the, uh, of two of the uh, English, uh, the London newspapers. So uh, weight, diabetes, well, you know, that's the uh, same sort of thing. Diabetes rates have uh, increased dramatically over, over the last few years and uh, it's been shown very much that, uh, that dietary carbohydrate restriction is the, is the way to go. Now, you know, I mean, sometimes my profession, I'm, I'm embarrassed to be a part of it, really. And uh, you know, you'd have to say that one of the dumbest decisions in the history of mankind was to decide to treat a disease in which you don't metabolize carbohydrates very well with a high carbohydrate diet. Now, you know, we laugh about it, but I mean, there are all these, uh, you know, intelligent, supposedly, you know, medical people for the last uh, 30, 40 years have treated diabetes with a high carbohydrate diet. I mean, it's just, you think about it and, you know, it's just mind boggling. But uh, anyway, eventually some of them might wake up to it, although I doubt it. Um, okay, so that's diabetes. Um, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You probably haven't heard an awful lot about that, but it's in epidemic proportions. 20 to 30 percent of people in the uh, developed world have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. At least if you have alcohol, you have some fun out of it, but uh, you don't even... Uh, <laughs> Don't even get that. And this can progress to non-alcoholic uh, hepatitis, cirrhosis and so on and can increase overall cardiovascular mortality. There's a lovely saying that, uh, that a professor came out with a couple of years ago. Before the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, there was a long silent scream from the liver. And it seems that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a precursor, part of that metabolic syndrome that's a precursor to, to diabetes. And, uh, you know, uh, it's a major problem. 
Uh, cardiovascular risk factors, we've heard a little bit about that and the way that uh, low carb has a positive effect on uh, on HDL. Uh, this is the same sort of thing as before, the low carb diets in blue, the low fat in, in black, and every time uh, we like to increase the HDL, that's the good cholesterol, um, and we uh, we decrease our triglycerides. Again, the comparison between low carb and low fat are pretty dramatic, you'd, uh, you'd have to agree. And uh, then, of course, our friends, the statins. Well, you know, it's much... Uh, much better for people to make money out of uh, out of uh, cholesterol than it is to uh, to put them on a diet and uh, uh, unbelievable amounts of money being spent on uh, on statins and what do they do well they make you live three or four days longer fantastic that's great <laughs> let's spend uh, let's spend a trillion dollars you know what a trillion is it's a thousand billion that's how much money has been spent on statins so far in the last uh, 20 years and uh, look, we can live three days longer. Isn't that fantastic? How, what does that work out per day? Uh, yeah, anyway, it's about 330 billion per day, I think. Uh, that's pretty good value for money. Um, so, yeah, statins are uh, terrific. Anyway, let's move on. Um, and uh, the last thing I want to talk about is inflammation. I want to give, tell you a story. Because uh, I think inflammation is the key to most disease. And uh, cardiovascular disease, the cholesterol theory is out the window now. It's now inflammation uh, that causes the, uh, the damage to the endothelial wall and, and the cholesterol then sticks to it. So uh, the cholesterol is a little bit like the, the fire engine at the fire. You know, it's always there, but it's not the cause. And uh, so uh, inflammation seems to be the cause of so many autoimmune diseases and, uh, and so on. And um, I want to tell you a story about, uh, about cricket. I know probably none of you are interested in cricket, but anyway, uh, we used to be good at it. But until um, uh, I came along, anyway, we were in uh, we were in India uh, a few years ago, and um, we're better than New Zealand, though. But anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry, Grant. Um, I, might, I may not be able to say that next week, so I better say it this week. Um, we uh, we were in, in India, and uh, it was my second tour with the, with the cricket team. The first tour was pre my. 13 kilogram weight loss, and the, and the second tour was was after it. And the, and the guys all sort of obviously noticed it was pretty clear. Um, and uh, you know, a few of them would ask me questions about it. Anyway, uh, I want to talk about one particular uh, player. And uh, this is a player who had uh, it was a, in the Australian team, uh, obviously a very good footballer, who uh, had had developed knee pain in uh, in one of his knees, and uh, he'd uh, had enormous problems with this. He'd basically had had to stop playing uh, a few months before this. And he'd been to every specialist around and uh, all these useless orthopedic surgeons and uh, uh, couldn't work out what was going on with him. Sorry, Gary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, speaking on behalf of the useless orthopedic surgeons is Gary Fetke. Uh, but <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> and... Um, Anyway, eventually uh, he was seen by a rheumatologist who decided he had uh, a type of arthritis called seronegative arthritis, which is similar to, to rheumatoid arthritis. Anyway, uh, they made that diagnosis. They put him on some very sort of heavy-duty drugs, prednisolone and methotrexate, which are really powerful drugs. They helped a little bit, not a great deal, and they put him on another very uh, new drug called Enbrel, which is $15,000 a year to your, your taxpayers' money, and, uh, and that sort of helped a reasonable bit, enough for him to, to play cricket again. So he was uh, on this Enbrel he would have an injection every three weeks, every two weeks, every 14 days, he would need an injection of this, uh, of this Enbrel. And he used to say to me, he said, oh, I used to know when it was time to get uh, my injection because after about 10 or 11 days, my knee would start to ache again and, uh, and so on. So uh, he came up to me at this, uh, on this tour and said, look, I'd like to try your diet because he, he was a little bit overweight. He wasn't able to train as much as everyone else. The coaches thought he was just lazy and slack. And, uh, but he was, he, if he trained too much, he had problems with his knee. And he said, look, Doc, I'd like to lose a bit of weight. And so I said, okay, well, we'll try the, try the diet. Anyway, he went hardcore. He was very, uh, very serious. And uh, he commenced uh, this, this low-carb diet. Three weeks later, he came up to me and said, now, Doc, uh, I wasn't going to tell you this, but I forgot to take my Enbrel last week. I said, oh, that's interesting. He said, yeah, I haven't had any knee pain. He said, what should I do? And I said, well, don't take it. You know, just see how it, uh, see how it goes. And, uh, you know, when you start getting the knee pain, you know, take your Enbrel. Well, that was uh, February 2013. He hasn't taken any Enbrel since. 
He hasn't taken a Panadol since. And uh, he's uh, back in the Australian Test Team this week. So um, not that I'm going to mention any names. But uh, he uh, no drugs, no pain. He was able to increase his training, uh, fully training. He lost that weight and uh, has had no problems with his knee. So instead of being treated with a $15,000 a year drug, he's been treated with, uh, with reducing the carbohydrates in his diet. And uh, it's been more effective. So... Uh, Pretty powerful story. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about performance because uh, you know can can you go low carb and uh, or paleo and still uh, compete at a, at a high level? Well, there are lots of uh, people who have uh, a lot of publicity about Kobe Bryant and the LA Lakers. And I was uh, at the Lakers a couple of weeks ago and uh, talking to Tim DeFrancesco, who's their fitness guy there, and they've certainly uh, got a number of their players who are uh, low carb uh, paleo. And the great LeBron James, who's probably the best basketballer in the world, has, uh, has done something similar. Even Andrew Bogut, our uh, Australian, who has uh, recently uh, got, his, got his ring for uh, the, the uh, NBA championship last year, he's cut back uh, 10 kilograms from cutting sugar from his, uh, from his diet. Some I mean, of the best American footballers, both uh, quarterbacks and, and linemen. Um, there are lots of elite athletes out there who are uh, paleo, particularly the endurance athletes. Tim Olson, this is the number one endurance runner in the in the USA. He's uh, he's totally sort of paleo low low carb. There are golfers, there are uh, golfers' girlfriends who happen to be skiers. Um, Novak Djokovic, that's a great story. Anyone read this book, Serve to Win? Really interesting book. Uh, Novak Djokovic was struggling. Uh, this is about five years ago. You might remember he used to uh, drop out of a lot of uh, tournaments. He'd forfeit a number of matches. He would sort of seem to tank matches where he would just physically sort of fall apart in the sort of third or fourth set. And... Um, there was a, uh, he's from Serbia, uh, as you know, and there was a Serbian doctor who uh, says he was watching the Australian Open five years ago in, uh, in a hotel in Cyprus. And, uh, and he saw what was happening to Novak Djokovic and he said, I know what's wrong with him. And he contacted Djokovic and uh, said, you've got, uh, you know, this is a food issue. You've got gluten issues. You've got other, uh, other issues. Uh, you need to adapt your diet and see how you go. And Djokovic says that within a week, of changing his diet and removing the gluten, removing a lot of the, uh, the carbohydrates from his diet, he noticed an enormous difference. And since then, he's virtually hasn't lost a, a tournament. So uh, he, yeah, it's a very good book, uh, Serve to Win. It's worth, uh, worth reading. Uh, from surfers to, to CrossFit, we've already heard about CrossFit and the, uh, the links with, uh, with paleo. And even some people call that sport. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> I come from Melbourne, and you know the religion down there is is AFL, and this is the son of God, and he was uh, he was he's into it. He's up this way these days, and uh, um, even uh, the Melbourne players, uh, you know, they were you couldn't really lose there because you know Melbourne was so bad they couldn't get any worse on a paleo diet, so. Uh, <laughs> It made them uh, made them look better, and uh, as some of you know, some of our cricketers, some of you would have seen the Catalyst program that uh, that we did last year with uh, with Shane Watson and so on. So a number of the cricketers have gone uh, gone low carb. So let's uh, briefly just finally talk a little bit about the history of, of fuel for exercise. So it's quite an interesting sort of story over the last hundred years ago. Now the endurance athletes a hundred years ago were our polar explorers, and they, they were the ones who really did enormous feats of endurance. Back in that 1949, there was a, uh, a very famous expedition looking for the Northwest Passage in, through the Arctic uh, called the Franklin's Expedition, and it disappeared off the face of the Earth. And for the next 100 years, people have been looking for it. And uh, there was this guy, Frederick Schwatka, who went looking for that, uh, that. and he finished up living with the, uh, with the local Inuit uh, Eskimo sort of uh, people. And after the first three weeks when he ran out of food, living off their diet, and their diet is completely sort of fat. It's all about, uh, um, it's all meat and fat. They'll, they uh, eat the blubber of the, uh, of the animals and the meat of the animals. No vegetables, no fruit, no dairy, nothing. He uh, lived off that for 11 months um, and then uh, and was perfectly healthy. Then uh, there was another guy called uh, Stephenson who was shipwrecked in, in the Arctic and similarly survived perfectly well with, uh, by killing uh, polar game for, uh, for a number of months. And he was interesting because uh, he then came back to, to the US and, and started telling people that and no one believed him. They said, well, how come he didn't get scurvy? How come he didn't get all these sort of uh, things? So he booked himself into a hospital for, um, for a year and, uh, and ate that uh, same diet he'd, he, uh, he ate while he was away with the, uh, uh, in the north uh, in the Arctic and uh, survived perfectly well, had no signs of impairment or no signs of nutrition deficiency. So they were basically low-carb, high-fat athletes of, uh, of 100 years ago. Um, jumping a little bit, and uh, this is 1939, 
when the first paper started coming out about, about the importance of muscle glycogen and carbohydrates. And this is the, probably the most famous paper by the Scandinavians, uh, Soltine and his group in 1967. This was the start of the sort of the carbohydrate loading craze. And everyone just went carb crazy. So if you were, that's when the, the running sort of boom started. So people started running uh, uh, fun runs and marathons and so on. And then the, the, the real was, you know, you had to fuel yourself with carbohydrates the night before, the two nights before, so you'd have your, your pasta party the night before the marathon, and you had to fill up your glycogen supplies completely, otherwise you would run out. And then you had to top yourself up during the, uh, during the actual race with carbohydrates because that was the fuel you needed to, uh, to compete. Uh, now that's uh, probably me, but uh, I was a great <laughs> carbo loader, but not such a good, uh, not a good runner. And and to be fair, you know that's what Tim Noakes, uh, who was the guru, he recommended. You know, only a high carbohydrate diet can optimise human exercise capacity. He'd be embarrassed to uh, to see that now, but uh, anyway. Um, but interestingly, uh, just recently, he uh, he made the very good point that probably the world's best best athletes are incredibly insulin sensitive and they're very capable of metabolizing carbohydrates very effectively and that's why they perform, uh, perform so well and that's undoubtedly why I'm not one of the world's best athletes. Uh, nothing to do with my lack of talent. But there have been other people over the years who uh, have challenged that and, and uh, 30, 30 years ago Steve Finney was talking about um, keto diet and uh, chronic ketosis and the uh, ability of the body to use fat as a fuel. But poor old Steve Finney was, in, uh, was ostracised really for 30 years. Uh, no one uh, talked to him, no one, he wasn't allowed to publish anything, he wasn't allowed to speak at any conferences, he didn't get any grants because he was uh, preaching this heresy that you could use fat as a fuel for endurance uh, exercise. And he put out this wonderful book with uh, Jeff Follick and full credit to him because he hasn't wavered from that and now fortunately he's, uh, he's back in favour again. And why, was it, why is it so attractive to have fat as a fuel? Because we've got so much of it. I mean, if, uh, if we only have, you know, a couple of thousand calories worth of, uh, of uh, carbohydrates stored in our muscle glycogen, we've got 100,000 of, uh, of uh, fat. So there's an enormous amount of fuel there. We're never going to run out of fuel uh, if we're using fat as a fuel. So it's very attractive fuel for endurance uh, performance. And as I say, you know, a couple of thousand calories of, uh, of carbs, so you need to keep replenish it, replenish it all the time, whereas fat, you've got a, a, an enormous capacity to, uh, to provide fuel. So what does the research say? Well, there's been a lot of research done uh, into various aspects of low-carb, high-fat diets in performance, uh, primarily in endurance exercise. There have been a number of studies looking at a short-term adaptation, and that doesn't seem to help at all. So in other words, you go uh, low-carb, high-fat for three or four days, and then they test uh, your different performance. That doesn't seem to help at all. It, it, what it does seem to help when you've had a longer adaptation time, probably four to six weeks, that's when you start getting advantages uh, from uh, a low-carb, high-fat diet. But again, the research is very poor. As far as strength goes, a lot of people say you need carbs for strength. The research shows that's not the case, that you don't, uh, you don't lose any strength by, uh, by low-carb. And the interesting thing is the high-intensity intermittent exercise, with, you know, the football, the basketball, the soccer and so on, where you're running up and down at, uh, at high bursts of speed. And the jury is probably still out on that. I think that's probably an individual thing, that some people seem to manage without carbs, others need a top up of, uh, of carbs on the day or, uh, or the night before. So uh, it's, there's a lot of problems with the uh, research, there's some, been very, some very good reviews of the research, but the research, they're mainly short duration, uh, you know, they're expecting to see a change in three or four days of a low carb diet. They have enormously varied definitions of what low carb is. You know, some people say 50% of uh, nutrients is low carb, you know, well that's, uh, that's a bit different to what we think various exercise intensities, so certainly the long-standing endurance exercise, it seems to be uh, beneficial to have a low-carb, high-fat when you're basically you're, you're running on your fat fuels. And there seems to be a difference between trained and untrained subjects. So we need a lot more uh, research before we know what's what's going on. A couple of very good articles by Noakes and Volokh and, and, and Finney uh, over the last uh, few months, and this is one that summarises the literature very well. And just a couple of quotes from that. The practical implications of the process of keto adaptation, so using fat as your fuel, uh, the human body can adapt to use fat as its primary fuel, fuel during submaximal exercise, while at the same time freeing itself from high rates of uh, glycogen use. So certainly submaximal exercise, long distance, probably marathon long and longer, 
high fat diet, high, using fat as your fuel is probably more efficient than using carbohydrate. At, at, at a higher intensity, shorter exercise, it's probably variable on an individual sort of basis. Now, there are other advantages also to having a, uh, a low-carb, high-fat diet in exercise. One of the really important things about exercise is recovery. And uh, so if you're playing football, we want you to be able to recover very quickly from, from Saturday's match so you can start training again on Tuesday. And it's quite clear that, uh, that was carbohydrate, high carbohydrates will produce lots of, uh, of damage to, uh, to your muscle. A higher fat diet will produce less, less tissue damage more muscle recovery and more able to train. Also with, uh, with power, I mentioned there's no loss of, uh, of uh, strength with a, a high fat diet, um, but if you can lose body fat and maintain your muscle fat, you've improved your power to weight ratio. So there are advantages for the strength athletes uh, as well. I started with uh, you know the story of one great cricketer. I'll start to finish with a second. Um, Mitchell Johnson, who uh, most of you would know as a Queenslander who's uh, defected, but uh, a great, uh, a great bowler. And uh, on that same tour of India two, uh, three years, two years ago, um, Mitchell also got interested in, uh, in a low-carb, high-fat diet and uh, has been uh, very consistent in that in the, in the meantime. And I thought uh, I'd, I'd give you a couple of quotes from an, a very good article written by Dean Jones. Um, Mitchell Johnson is the most feared cricketer in the world. His sheer speed, aggressive attitude, tattoos and bikey moustache make batsmen all over the world have sleepless nights. I asked Johnson this week what had changed in his life. He said he changed his diet. He eats a lot of vegetables and meat and strictly no processed foods. He looks so good. Some of the Pakistani boys couldn't look at him. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I find him quite attractive myself, but anyway, that's, uh, that's okay. And uh, he, uh, he had a great, uh, a great presence. So I'd just like to uh, conclude uh, with just a little bit of sporting uh, history for you, um, especially in honour of our, of our New Zealand visitor uh, here. And, and I notice there's actually a lady here in an All Blacks uh, shirt, you know, which is, is good because she won't be able to wear it tomorrow. But, um, um, but I thought, you know, I've got a little quiz for you, Grant. Um, I'd like to ask you, there have been three World Cups in 2015. What do they all have in common? There was the final of all three World Cups were Australia versus New Zealand. So I'd just like to remind Grant of that, uh, you know, I'd like to congratulate New Zealand, a very small country, you know, to make finals of World Cups is an outstanding achievement. So on behalf of us all, I'd like to congratulate uh, New Zealand. <laughs> and I'd just like to remind you of the results of those three World Cups. <laughs> One, two, and of course what's going to happen tonight will be three. Thank you very much.